right, we're on the eighth episode of the Exit Strategy Podcast. We're here with Jay Kassan, who's the co-founder and CEO of Movement Watches. Uh, Jake, Movement is an accessories company that sells uh, fashion items that shouldn't break the bank. Is that a good way to describe it or is that a bad way to describe it? No, I think that's a, a great way to describe it. Uh, we've evolved since to, you know, we started with watches. We started with six watches at our core, uh, price anywhere between $95 and $100 kind of comparable to those 300 to $500 price point watches. And then, you know, the goal was to continue to build a lifestyle brand and, and, you know, grow into other accessories. So now we have everything from watches, men's, women's, to sunglasses, to jewelry. Uh, and one of our, our most popular products uh, as of late is actually our blue light blocking ever scroll glasses. Um, everyone's stuck in front of their screens all day. And uh, I think a lot of people, at least my, me, I, ha I had some trouble, you know, falling asleep or sleeping and, uh, because I'm staring at screens all day, we have nothing else to do. And uh, these truly filter, they filter out. This is kind of a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, this is me selling it a little bit, but like, uh, uh, this is a little shameless, but shameless plug. But it, it the, the cool thing about them is like, uh, you, everyone has the device on their screen or has a, an yeah. option on their screen to block it, but it actually distorts the color. So for us, uh, it just, it filters the color. So if you shine blue light in, it just blocks it and filters it. So graphic designers or gamers, whatever it is, like you're able to, to continue to, to, you know, do what you do without uh, affecting kind of your sleeping patterns. But anyways, that's, that's been blowing up for us right now. So, and the goal is, is to continue to, to branch out into other accessories and really be a, a truly a lifestyle brand. Uh, who bought, like who buys the blue light stuff? I feel like, um, you know, whenever I talk to people from LA, I'm just like, do you guys, all you guys think about is LA stuff. <laughs> I'm talking to Steve from Olipop. I don't know if you know him. I think he's based in LA. Um, and he's telling me about stuff. And I'm like, everything you just said is very uh, LA. When I talk yeah. to Nick, who's a mutual friend of ours who runs Thrive Market, yeah. you know, he's like, yeah, I'm taking these beehive, um, you know, <laughs> pollen shots. And I'm yeah. like, that's so LA of you. Yeah, um, yeah. Is, is a blue light blocker LA or am I just missing the boat here? I think it might have started as LA. It was kind of like something people like to wear and be fashion forward, even yeah. if they didn't have prescription eyewear. But I think given the world we live in today, it's accelerated yeah. uh, the need for them. And, 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 and truly, there's a, there is a, a benefit to it. I mean, yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's proof, there's, there's data backing it. So I think what maybe was somewhat of a fashion trend has now yeah. turned into a real utility that, that, that uh, is helpful. So yeah. that's a great maybe, or maybe I, to, to be honest, honest I've been in my house. LA, so I, I want to do this now because if, if yeah. it's LA, I, I want to do it over here. I live in LA. I haven't been out of my house in, in you know a while, so maybe it is LA. I don't know, but uh, it's doing well for us. I think around the, the nation and globally. So gotcha. Um, okay, let's get started with like the beginning of Movement Watches. Would love to start with the, like uh, I, I know you guys launched on Indiegogo, but even taking a step back from that, you know, uh, you're the youngest e-commerce entrepreneur that's super successful that I've ever met. Uh, before you started uh, Movement Watches. You dropped out of college. You were twenty. I read that you dropped out of college and that you were twenty thousand dollars in debt, uh, and then you decided to start movement watches. Is that right? Yeah, debt. So, so debt was to partially credit card debt. So I wasn't about. I think it was like six, seven thousand dollars in credit card debt, um, funding my lifestyle more so, and, and movement partially. Uh, like I was still in college and I, I, had, I had stopped working at the time to put all my energy in the movement. And so I was in debt to, you know, I had 18 months of like interest free credit card debt. Uh, so I, I maxed those, those out for samples and everything else. And then, uh, you know, as well, I had uh, received money from kind of uh, family and friends for a previous business uh, that just ended up crashing and burning. It was, it was doing well at its, at its peak. Yeah. I had, I needed some capital con to continue to kind of grow it. And then, uh, yeah, it left me in, in kind of a, a place of, you know, I, I don't think I ever, some of the money came from my parents. So I've definitely uh, returned that money since, sure, but, uh, sure. but uh, yeah, it was, it was largely kind of credit card and, and family and friends money. So that's so great. I, I feel like you rarely hear about entrepreneurs who have had the success that you've had and actually like, you know, legitimately have a story about credit card debt. Usually it's all these like guys who sort of had, you know, who, who had like dads who were millionaires and sort of like, like, um, were able to fund their own success or yeah. raise money because they had all these amazing connections. You built movement or you started movement watches actually swiping your own credit card yeah. being like, yeah, I need to pay for samples. Yeah. Like for me too, it was like back against the wall. That's fucking insane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your back is against the, I mean like you chose to make your back against the wall. 
Like you're you're swiping the credit card ordering samples of watches. Yeah. Uh, because, and you're like giving up your work opportunities and ended up dropping out of college for this business. You you chose to put yourself uh, your back against this wall. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking risk. <laughs> it's all it's all you have though starting off, right? Like for me, my dad, you know, had a business was was you know uh, kind of middle class and and but during the last you know recession that we were in, completely business went out when you know uh, he had to close his doors after twenty years. Um, and lay off his employees, et cetera, and ran through you know their savings. So I saw financial stress from them. Uh, I was supporting myself in college, but granted I had kind of planned on dropping out regardless. I wasn't doing much in college because I had my previous business before movement that I was hoping was going to be you know the big winner. And then when that went under, it was kind of like, okay, I have an opportunity to fund another business uh, using my credit card you know that I currently have. Let me, let me go big. And, and, and honestly, my mentality, and, and maybe it was a little overdramatic, but, or maybe not, it was, I'll go get, I'll go work anywhere. If, if this doesn't work out, I'll go pay this off. But yeah. like, and I think people who have their back against the wall typically end up succeeding because it, it sometimes it takes that to like really figure it out and grind and put in the extra energy. And you may try 10, to, as you know, you may try 10 different things and only one works out, but like that one thing may sure. be the difference. So yeah. Uh, uh, give me a poor and hungry person in any day of, of the week uh, versus like a rich Harvard grad. Like yep. a poor and hungry person is going to want to like uh, succeed and has a lot more like uh, at stake basically. Yep. Uh, but like, it's crazy that you're like, I funded my business on a credit card. Like everyone's like, I funded my business with the millions of dollars I had. I funded my business with Andreessen Horowitz money. No one's like, yeah, I funded my business with this visa card that I had in my yeah. pocket. Yeah. Uh, do you still freedom. have the same credit card that you use to buy that stuff? No. I, <laughs> okay, there it is. I love it. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. Uh, but uh, what a great card. I mean, shit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's crazy. So you launch, the, like, you know, you get these samples. You've got six watches. You launch on Indiegogo. That's how you sort of get the business started. Yeah. So so back then, you know, uh, I think that I needed some, I, need, I knew I needed a source to, uh, to you know, drive orders. I knew I yeah. needed capital to continue to go forward uh, we needed at least like 15 grand to actually place the first po uh, okay. so so it was like okay we need at least 15 grand and and that was that was the small goal that was like if we do that we may just give the money back because yeah. is it is it really worth it in the end of the day to to, to to you know move forward we so we ended up doing like 15k the first i don't know 30 days of the campaign it was a 50 day campaign and then and based off of like indiegogo at the time their algorithms etc we got feature on the homepage and then went from, we did another 30 K that day and then just spiraled off ending around 300 K in, in pre-orders. Gotcha. So, so your mentality was, look, if we only get 15 K in sales over 50 days, we're just going to cancel this whole project, give everyone their money back and go, work, go do something else. Cause that's just not worth the business. But potentially it was like, yeah. does this even back out? Yeah. So you do 15 K the first 30 days and Indiegogo features you on the homepage and you get another 30 K as a result of that. Yep. And, it, and that's, that, sorry, go on. Were you in touch with them to get them to feature you or did they just like their algorithm was like, these guys should get the homepage for today? No. So that was, that was, you know, we, again, being kind of dropouts in, in college, we were or dropouts of college. We were just kind of studying the platform. Yeah. So we knew that we knew that like there was algorithms that we had kind of figured out how they worked. And some of them was like, you know, as a campaign's ending, it, it, it gets pushed to the top of a page or uh, you know, if, if a campaign, gets a certain amount of funding percentage wise they get pushed if you send an, gotcha. enough email there's all these hacks like yeah. i was big the word growth hack to me back then was like i mean that was like i loved and, and breathed that right it was like yeah. that's what i live by today growth hacking isn't always scalable to some yeah. degrees it can be but like uh at some point it was like okay i need to figure out different ways to scale the business but back then growth i was a growth hacker yeah, I mean, it's still like it works when you're going from like zero to one, right? Yeah. It doesn't work when you're going from 50 million to 100 million. Like there's no tiny growth hack that you figured out where you're like, I just got 50 million in sales. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there yeah. is growth hacks to be like, okay, I got an extra 30,000 in sales. Those yeah. exist uh, back back in 20. When, when did you start launch the business? This is back in uh, it was two uh, 2013. Yeah, so in 2013, they exist. I think they still yeah. exist in 2020. Yeah, Th that'll get you from like, you know, 15,000 to 30,000 or 15,000 to 50. Oh, 100%. Um, 
Are you, are you, were you running paid, like, you know, um, today when people run Kickstarter campaigns and I, I see a bunch of Facebook ads saying, hey, go check out this Kickstarter campaign um, and, and go, were you running paid ads behind this uh, Indiegogo campaign or was this all organic? Back it? then it was large that we, we were paying certain uh, publishers, certain like um, blogs to post about us. So we had blogs like Cool Material. Yeah. Um, and then I basically, I, I, I again, found a, uh, uh, some sort of software that was, uh, allowed me to, uh, kind of reach out to, to editors. Basically it aggregated, I type in a topic, it aggregate articles a across the web and then it, it give me the editor's email and I, I had, I exported them to an Excel and sent a personal email with their name, everything yeah, to, 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 to 200 people. I ended up getting 15 or something of them to post about it, which was great. Playboy was one of them. I was like, okay, I'll take it, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and then those gave us kind of uh, momentum and that combination with like kind of a few other strategies. Reddit was a big one. We, uh, we were banned from Reddit. Actually, we got kicked off of Reddit. There's, I created about a hundred different Reddit accounts. We had a, a proxy, which hides your IP address. So we would log in using different IP addresses, posting with IP, different IP addresses and then upvote. And then you gain momentum. And then once you got enough momentum, you just skyrocket. They call yeah. that uh, astroturfing. Um, one of the subreddits we, we did was called Shut Up and Take My Money. So it was literally, hey, here's a product I want. These are consumers who are looking to buy something. Yeah. Uh, and somehow the detectives of Reddit fit, traced back something. And there's like, a, yeah. there's a thread somewhere. It's great. And it has a ton of upvotes. But there's a thread about how we movement astroturfed Reddit. And so now, there's a love hate relationship I have with Reddit. Um, but anyways, that was, that, I don't know if you can still do that today, but that was like a big piece of like organic traffic basically. And this is back when you're still running the Indiegogo campaign. You're, you're trying to get Reddit to post about you guys. So people will click over to Indiegogo and start funding. Pretty much. Yeah. Do you think Indiegogo is still like a viable launch strategy today? Like I feel like in 2013, everyone was talking about, like I'd go to Kickstarter once a week and sort of look at the new projects. Um, I feel like now a bunch of people have been burned by Kickstarter and probably Indiegogo because they're just like, I, I placed an order for something. I, I ordered a case for my iPhone X or my iPhone 10. It didn't get, uh, it didn't get shipped to me until the iPhone 11 came out and now it's yeah. useless. Is yeah. it, are Indiegogo and Kickstarter as big as they were back then? Or like, how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah. I don't think you have like the big, the big, big winners, at least that I know of otherwise, yeah. cause I don't hear about them anymore. Right. Uh, yeah. And people have been burned by like the coolest cooler and stuff like yeah. that. They don't, they don't yeah. even ship. Um, but what I would say is like, you know, I would, rather than looking at us as like, you know, uh, an example of, of how we did it, right. That was 2013. And as we know, like technology and the world changes so quickly, I would go and find people who have successfully funded in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. And if they've done it, then I would say that there could be an argument to still maybe go get friends and family money, or maybe before you even go out and do that, it just use it as like a platform to get, cause regardless there's still millions of people that are using Indiegogo and, and Kickstarter. Yeah. So regardless, there's still an opportunity to get, you know, your product in front of faces for generally free. Um, so I'd argue like it's a good marketing tool, whether you raise 300 K or you raise 50 K or 20 yeah. it's there's, I still think there could be a benefit to it. Now with Facebook and everything else, I don't know how like, you know, the market, like the marketing stack and how it integrates with, with Indiegogo or Kickstarter. But I would, again, yeah. if I were starting over, I would look at someone who's recently funded uh, and, and just kind of reverse, I mean, reverse engineering again, growth hacking, reverse engineering. Those are the two things. Like I take a brand and just completely reverse engineer Indiegogo reverse engineer. So yeah, I would do the same. Uh, gotcha. Okay. So you, you think that there's still viable strategies, but like, did you realize once you were uh, on Indiegogo that you had found a product that was going to be big and scale or did it take some more time? Like, you know, with native, in the first two months, like we were seeing um, a cost of customer acquisition of, of under $2 for the first two months. And I was just like, this business is going to work. I don't have the pro like I haven't made the product yet. That's great enough to drive this, uh, drive an enormous business. But I know this business is going to work because people are buying this stuff at $2. Like yeah. it cost me $2 in advertising to sell this product. Like that's phenomenal. Like, you know, yeah. it doesn't happen today any longer, but like, um, I knew instantly that the uh, business would work and it took me a little bit of time to reformulate the product and really get like product market fit and see a ton of growth. 
Um, when did you know that Movement Watches is going to work? Did you like? Was it the day that you were on the homepage and you're like, we just did another fifteen thousand dollars? Is fucking great, or did it take some more time? Yeah, I think there's different levels of of what what's working, right? I think yeah, when we did when we got on the homepage and did thirty k in a day, I said, okay, this is this is real now. That's real yeah. money. Okay. This is real. Let's yeah. think about this. But then you know you have your Q4 holiday, you know numbers. You start seeing what you. I remember there was a day where we had like a twenty five thousand dollar, you know, day, and that for. Yeah. At that time, it was like, holy shit, that's, yeah. that's huge. And we've scaled since then, but like, yeah. there's just, there's just, you have days like that. And, and, and every, each time you're like, you're just reevaluating, like, even what you're thinking about it and like the expansion of, of kind of where your business can go, as yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so like, like, you know, Indiegogo campaigns over, you realize, hey, look, uh, we're going to start this business. We're definitely not refunding people's money. We're going to actually ship this product. We want to go make it. Uh, like, what are the, do you have any operational, you know, when we launched Native, the first time we placed a, we, we were supposed to pick up stuff at our manufacturer, we used a freight forwarder to like uh, drive a truck there and pick it up. They were supposed to arrive on a, oh, like a Tuesday, they didn't come. On Wednesday, they didn't come. On Thursday, I got, I dispatched another company to go pick up the, the deodorants that we had our manufacturer. And the first guy picked them up. And we'd already canceled that order. So I was like, wait, our deodorants are on a truck. And I was like, is this manufacturer just lying to me? Oh, because no. we were supposed to get all these deodorants and they're on the wrong truck. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, what the fuck is happening? Do you guys have any of those operational? Like, Because you guys aren't making this stuff in the United States, I imagine, uh, right out of gate. Or are you making it in the U.S.? No, we're making it, no, we're making it overseas uh, in Asia. Um, and so are there operational challenges like that right out of the gate? Because like, have you dealt with Asian uh, you know, manufacturers and like, like shipping things on boats or air freight? Like are, are there operational challenges right out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a learning curve, I think more than anything. Yeah. Um, we had a 3PL, so we had a third party, you know, kind of helping us with our fulfillment. And they, they took on a lot of like the logistical kind of stuff in terms of um, kind of the importing. Uh, I think I think they might've even been the importer of record if I'm not mistaken, but you know, it was a long time ago. I don't remember us having anything that was like a major yeah. issue per se, uh, fortunately, but uh, it was more of just a learning curve and figuring out, you know, what, what the best way to do it, what the most affordable way to do it. I think a lot of times you just yeah. pay a premium because you don't know better. And then it's, uh, I, we, we ended up starting to ship, yeah. ship uh, by boat. And then you have to, you know, kind of build that into uh, kind of your, your timeline. And then you also hear like, you know, well, is the condensation like while going over the ocean, like ruin the, the, the watches in the boxes. So there's just a lot of like logistical things you have to keep in mind and think about, but we've never really had a major, you know, uh, okay. stopping block or yeah, exactly. Yeah. Was it difficult to find the manufacturer? Like I would imagine, uh, or was it like, was that easy? Like, do you just go to, you know, uh, the Shenzhen, whatever fair that they have <laughs> and they're, they're like, okay, there's 400 watch manufacturers here. Or is it like really hard to find that guy? You know, you could, you certainly could uh, go to like a fair and meet with manufacturers. Again, we thinking of flying to China for us when we were just getting started to, to get some, something sampled. Uh, I didn't have the credit card uh, credit to, to, to do that. So <laughs> we ended up, we ended up going on Google and doing some research and finding uh, a manufacturer that kind of, or a consultant who, who knew different manufacturers and uh, we worked with him initially and then, uh, I think once you really start to get going, like once our Indiegogo caught attention, then you have uh, other manufacturers who are maybe a little bit more legitimate, a little bit more reputable, start reaching out. And I don't think it was until our, maybe almost our third year, maybe our second year where we actually flew to China and met with different uh, manufacturers. And uh, in the watch world, there's like middlemen. So like for us, we have, or not middlemen, but we have uh, the, the movements uh, inside of our watches, um, you know, we have a quartz Myota movement uh, for most of our watches. So uh, Myota, it's they're they're in most like quartz watches. So they're incentivized to go and introduce us to the best manufacturer. So they went and kind of uh, you know uh, pulled us into the three top manufacturers and kind of got to see who was vibing with our business at the time and who believed in us and. Uh, and, and kind of went from there. And have you had to switch manufacturers since you started the business? Like from that Indiegogo campaign to today, have you been like, okay, I went from here, I scaled up beyond this facility, so I went here, or are you still with the same guy? Yeah, so we have, no, we're, we're not with the uh, original. We have uh, multiple manufacturers, pr you know, prior to, to Movado, the Movado acquisition, we had multiple manufacturers. Um, I think for multiple reasons, you know, some manufacturers are better at, at producing, yeah. you know, different things. Um, I think it's always great to, to, you know, whether you want to leverage them against each other, not to be, not to, not to bully them, but just simply to make sure that they're being, 
uh, giving you the best price. Yeah. And um, so there, there, there's like, there's, there's benefits uh, to that. You know, some, some manufacturers can only do a certain amount of production. And so it's just, it's keeping them, you know, responsible for, you know, what they're doing and motivated so that they don't take advantage of, of you in any way. Post Movado, and I'm not sure if you can talk about this. Have you moved manufacturing in house? Like is Movado doing the manufacturing or are you sort of still doing the same thing that you were with your own independent contractors? So no, we're still doing the same thing. Movado does, the, you know, they, they do Swiss and et cetera, but uh, I'm pretty sure that for us, at least we, we have still third parties. And yeah. I think largely the, 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 you know, fashion watch industry uh, courts, you know, movement is all you, you, you I don't think it really makes sense to go and yeah, o- uh, open up your own sure. uh, factory, at least to my, my knowledge. Um, so, okay. So you're launching the brand. It's 2013 Indiegogo campaign successful. Like what is your, what does your revenue look like in 2014? Uh, you know, six years ago or 2015. Yeah. Like, yeah. So like, you're, it- so the, the first three years it went, so first year we ended, uh, at about a million with including the, the Indiegogo. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think we did much. It was like blogs. It was uncrate. You know, we were paying, the, the money I, I spent was like, get on uncrate, get on cool material, yeah. you know, figure out, you know, those type of things more so than uh, rev, rev share type of opportunity, commission type of opportunities. Uh, so it was pretty organic, which was great. Um, so you're not, we, you weren't paying for uncrate. You were like, Hey, uncrate, we'll give you 15% of sales. Uh, no, no, no. So, so, so uncrate, there was a few of them. So a few publishers uncrate, you pay, you know, a flat fee, yeah. uh, yeah. back then it was like 7,500 bucks for yeah. a, a feature, but it would return, you know, largely uh, a large amount of, uh, of orders. So those are like big opportunities that no longer exist, but also they were like unknown opportunities. So it was kind of navigating a, a sea that no one knew like where to yeah. go. Growth um, hacking. It's growth hack. <laughs> exactly. So now, so now, so now it's a little bit more. Everyone is look, knows and has seen, you know, us or me on these or you guys on all of these blogs. So it's it's saturated and it doesn't just it just doesn't perform like it once did. Um, but it was largely blogs um, and 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 then some was organic as well. We did a big like refer a friend. We really really encourage our uh, our team to um, or not our team but our customers to refer their friends for either store credit or discounts. And then one of the biggest things we did back then was like every 500 likes. On Facebook, we did we gave away a free watch, uh, and then it got too much, so we did a thousand, and that was our fastest growing platform, Facebook. Uh, and that was just you know, we were like, okay, if we can get five hundred new people to like us. Yeah, there's some, at least one person's buying a watch from that. Yeah, it's worth giving out a watch, and and people just went nuts about that, and we just scaled through that. So that was that was year one. Year two, we started to play with Facebook. Year two, we did seven million, and that that was like the rocket ship is where I think we were getting like ten dollars CPAs for a hundred dollar watch. Uh, and that was when yeah. it just, it just took off. And then so, year uh, three, year we did 30. Is 2014. Yeah. So, so year so one, go, year one was a uh, million to seven yeah, to 30. To 30. And it yeah. goes from blog to Facebook to more Facebook. Blog to Facebook to a lot more Facebook. And then after probably 30, it was like, how do we diversify yeah. different acquisition channels? We don't want to be solely bet on on facebook what if it gets saturated what if cpms go up blah 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 here we are today <laughs> yeah i remember when we were like um the first time native uh raised money we went we went to like one, one of our investors was putting on some sort of like marketing day show and we went there and there were facebook reps and they're like yeah uh, on instagram we're allowing certain le- vendors or like certain businesses to advertise and one of the first businesses is movement watches really? And I was like, how the fuck are you guys one of the first? <laughs> did you guys know, do you know that? Like you were one of the first businesses, like you had special access to be able to advertise on Instagram. Before I think else. we did know that we, so back in the day I was like, I mean, I was running it out the gate and then yeah. we worked with kind of a, a, a freelance consultant and then we uh, ended up hiring in house. But uh, it was like, you know, anytime there was a beta because we saw the success and I knew, yeah. I knew Instagram was going to be huge because I used it as a consumer and the, the numbers of its growth. So we were like, get us on the beta, get us on the beta. Uh, I was, we were really lucky for two reasons. Uh, there was, I, we, we worked right next to the, the Facebook LA office. Uh, so yeah. we basically just kind of bear hugged Facebook and like, we, we made sure that that was like a network that we stayed close to. And I'm friendly with a bunch of people over there, just in the sense of like, you know, not, not that we were getting necessarily special kind of, um, you know, special service, but it was just being able to talk to them more frequently about what was going on before we had like a small business rep in Texas. And that was just, you hear from them once a month and it just, it was like, yeah. you know, surface level stuff. So. Yeah. It is weird that like um, Facebook has sort of outsourced so many of your our representatives. Like I think it's in Austin and they're like, you know, even if you're spending 
you know, $10 million a year. They're like, here's some rep in Austin that like millions yeah. are going to give you great, uh, great feedback. You really have to network your way within Facebook in order to get the right people on your account. Yeah, definitely. I think they're, I hope, I, I think they're doing a better job, but, um, I don't know. I mean, we've been, we've been, we've been, we're in LA and we're close to them. So we've been in the network. So maybe we've been, you know, working with certain teams just because of that. But we also have spent, as you guys, I'm sure, a significant amount of money on Facebook. So. Yeah. Yeah. Once we were a part of PNG, uh, they assigned PNG reps to our account. And so like, you know, we were no longer in the, um, uh, in the Austin office. So I'm not sure what's happened the last two years. Yeah. They have different, they have, uh, I know they have different set. There's like a growth, like a, I forgot, like it's like a growth. So it's like brands yeah. that are in the 10 millions plus and spending, you know, millions on Facebook. And then you have like, uh, yeah, like the, the, the big guys who are, uh, you know, like big corps, whether it's yeah. Yeah, exactly, sure. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so like, you know, uh, unlike uh, almost everyone else I've ever chatted with, you guys never raised a dollar of like outside capital. You guys are funding this on credit cards. And then once you sort of hit that $7 million range, I'm sure you're profitable or break even and sort of fund it. You know, did you ever, uh, did you ever think that you should raise money? Did you ever try and raise money or were you like, no, this business is working. I want to control our own destiny. Let's keep it all in house. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was always a, an internal kind of discussion that me and Kramer, my co-founder had about do we raise money? Why, why would we raise money? Everyone else is raising money. Why are they raising money? Does yeah. it make sense? Like, do we need to grow faster than we're growing? And, uh, and, and, you know, there was a time where we were strongly considering at, at a later stage to go and raise money to help kind of with expansion and, and, and growth. And, um, you know, that, and that, that, you know, fortunately for us, it was kind of right, right around the time where we started talking with Movado and that just made so much more sense for us based, you know, just the, the, the synergies in terms of brand and, and just like, you know, where we wanted to go, they already uh, largely knew and what were able to support and help us. So that made more sense than doing it ourselves and raising capital and diluting ourselves. But um, it was tough. I think back then the dialogue wasn't as, it wasn't as, there wasn't, you know, guys like me and you and others who were talking about like, you know, stay, stay lean, sure. you know, look what happened. And, and there wasn't examples of the bonobos and, and, you know, I can't even think, uh, what, what's the other, uh, like company that just, uh, there's brandless. There's uh what was the one that just came out the other day? Um, anyways, uh, uh, Ca- like Cas- look at Casper's IPO, right? Like, yeah. Uh, four hundred million. They raised four hundred million dollars, and now they're worth three hundred million. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. there's a ton of those companies. There's yeah. WeWork that raised. Blue a ton Apron. Of money. Blue Apron's a great so, example. Yeah. There's a- so, anyways, probably more, more so, more of them than less of them, right? Like yeah. have, have turned out to be failures, unfortunately, and at largely not not because they're a necessarily a bad business, just because they raised at a crazy multiple that they can't, you know, uh, kind of get you know run from. So, anyways, that wasn't as apparent, and we just kind of like F, I, we networked with a lot of people and that was the one thing. Cause we didn't go to business school. I wouldn't say that like from the finance side of it, like that's not where our specialty is. We were like brand builders and scrappy and entrepreneurs and kind of seizing opportunities and, and, you know, enjoying the process. So we talked to a lot of different founders uh, to, who had raised money. And to be frank, like a lot of them were kind of not happy and, 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 and said, stay away, stay away. And it was just weird that every time we talked to someone who we idolize in terms of, the business that is yeah. all over the news and gets all the press would be like, don't do it. If you don't need, if you're making money, don't do it, blah, 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 blah. And now, I mean, I think that just makes so much sense for so many reasons. And, you know, from, from, and we talk about this even, you know, offline all the time, but it's just like, in terms of brands being able to acquire you for, for a, a, you know, a reasonable number, like the second you go and raise money, you may out, you may outprice yourself for so many, you know, brands and you just cause complications for, you know, you may be growing an unhealthy business, which uh, will hurt you in the long run. Yeah, sure. Like there's a day that that all sort of comes back and haunts you, right? Like you could raise, you could be celebrating and being like, yeah, we just raised, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you before, when we were raising money and we talked to a fund and they're like, we'll put in $3 million at a $30 million valuation or $30 million at a $3 million million dollar valuation so i was like i could get a 30 million dollar valuation or a 300 from this person sitting across the yeah. table from me right now like that doesn't make any sense and they, they they're they're very honest about it they're like look at 300 you're gonna have to work here for five more years and build a 600 700 million dollar exit yeah just, uh and i was like that's uh, I was like, that five to 10 years, I have no idea what the world is going to look like five or 10 years from now. I don't know if I have the capacity to uh, work that, like, you know, I don't know if I can maintain this and build yeah. an $800 million business. And the $3 million just doesn't seem that interesting. Yeah. You know what's crazy is now I also, like, 
when you're look, when you're starting to look at companies, when I see a bunch of ads like in the subways of New York City or on billboards, I'm just like, I don't know if that ROI is going <laughs> back out. I'm no longer like, holy shit, that brand is awesome. I'm just like, I'm not sure if this ROI is going back out. When I see sales happening at the end of quarters, like at the end of March or at the end of June, I'm just like, these guys are looking to meet quarterly numbers that they're you know that are that are required by their board. Yeah, and so um, seeing how businesses are sort of building themselves up. Um, specifically because they raise a ton of outside capital instead of trying to focus on building the best business. Yeah. And I feel like the reason might be, and, and I'm not sure about this, but like, you know, I think that the VCs who had a lot of experience in tech, like tech needs capital often, right? Uh, yeah. Not always, not always as much capital as some of these tech companies have, have, have received. I was just looking at Shopify the other day. I think they've only raised or before, kind of before they went public, they only raised like 130 million or something like that which isn't really a ton. Uh, Honey, I think raised like 60. Uh, and so Shopify is now worth $74 billion raised at like a 300, 400 million valuation. And Honey, I think raised 60 million and sold for 4 billion. So even those companies, Honey raised less money than like Casper or Mobos or any yeah. of these guys, which, which again, it's like, I think it's just because VCs wanted scale. They wanted growth versus having a healthy brand, really focusing on the consumer. And like, if it's resonating, it's resonating. You can't force it. And I think that's where people got, you know, people can, you can force people to buy someone. You can spend a lot of money. You can spend a thousand dollars for someone to buy a watch if you wanted to, right? Like that's sure. possible to do, but it doesn't back out. And that's what they were doing on, you know, Blue Apron or Casper and et cetera. And, um, and now the, the mentality has shifted. I mean, I hear it. Uh, just from like my network that like VCs are looking for more profitable businesses and they're, you know, it's, it's, it's a total mind shift. And it's funny. Cause like back in the day, I remember talking to some of the bigger, like bigger funds and uh, just, just networking, not even looking to raise, but we talk about our business and kind of get laughed that it's like not, it's laughed at like, it's just not, it's not a real business. It's not going to, you can't scale this business, blah, blah, blah. And so I don't know. And in it's, reality, it's the only real business. <laughs> exactly. It's like the actual exactly. real business. And they were exactly. wrong about everything else. There was exactly. this uh, VC, I remember he tweet, uh, like he wrote this article recently, I tweeted him, I forgot what his name was. And he's like, um, the reason that Glossier and Away are working is because they don't have any competition, as opposed to like the Caspers of the world that have a ton of competition. And I'm like, are you fucking insane? You think Away doesn't have any competition in fucking luggage? Yeah. Luggage. You think they invented <laughs> luggage? Yeah. Airplanes have been around for a hundred years yeah. now. Yeah. You crazy motherfucker. Uh, yeah. And he's like, then I, I like tweeted him and he's like, of course they have competition. They're just like, they have less competition. I'm like, they do a great job with branding. They do a great job with marketing and they're out hustling people building brand and like being operationally efficient as opposed to the Caspers of the world that weren't operationally efficient and burned a ton of money. Yeah. Um, it is insane how VCs don't get direct to consumer, even though it's been around for so long and they've put so much money into it. Yeah. I think they're, I think so you're building. Yeah, I, so I, I think, and I hope that they're starting to, and then, and, and they're, you know, I think, and maybe not the biggest ones because they're looking for big opportunities, but some, some smaller, you know, VCs are look are, are, are happy with the smaller exit, right? Like yeah. they're okay with that. Uh, but I think the VCs that we were talking to back in the day are, you know, have huge funds with, with businesses like Snapchat and so forth. And if they, you know, they, they want a billion dollar valuation type of or billion dollar exit is kind of what they want when, when you think about it. So. And did you like, um, had that mind, had that mindset already shifted by the time you were selling movement watches or was that still like i feel like that's a pretty new mindset i'm not even sure like you sold the business in 2018 i'm not sure that mindset existed in 2018 i sold my business in 2017 i'm positive it didn't exist in 2017 in 2017 people were like why are you selling your business why don't you raise more money and really grow this thing and i was like we're doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue we're doing a uh, million dollars in ebitda a month at this point like um it is a fucking real business yeah. And I don't know how much longer I can keep, continue this growth trajectory. And I'm not sure I can do it by myself. Um, you know, had that mind sh mindset shifted to profitability by the time you sold your business or was that still a year away? Uh, I mean, we, so, so sorry, are you saying were we always profitable or are you saying just- No, no, like, no. I'm saying had VCs, had VCs started thinking about profitability in 2018? Uh, no, no, no. Do you no. think it happened in 2019 or 20? I actually think one of the bigger, or bigger articles that came out, uh, I think you were in it as well, Jason Del Rey from- um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Recode. publication. Recode. Yeah, 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 Recode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he published, and it was like me, you, two big acquisitions. Who? And he kind of he the writing on the wall foreshadows. And and I think it might have been Lisa as well. He goes, these companies, you know, either raise very little or are profitable, and you're seeing acquisitions uh, successful. Everyone's successful in the acquisition, right? Employees 
get money, we get money, like the, you know, the acquirer is happy, like it's across the board, it's a good acquisition. And uh, he kind of says, is this the future? And I think that was probably right around 2018. And I think you, I started to see a shift when Bonobos, you know, kind of get got got written off by by uh, Walmart, and, and yeah. you start to just see kind of a trend across the 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 kind of industry. But yeah, to your point, I don't think it was I don't think it was um, adopted you know widely until probably more recently than ever. Yeah, yeah, it was the Tufts and Needle folks that he mentioned in that article. Yeah, uh, oh, Tufts and like, Needle. These are gotcha, the guys gotcha. that like uh, hadn't raised any money. Yep. Um, okay, let's go back a little bit more to like movements growth, you know, from one 730, you're focusing on Facebook, you diversify channels of acquisition. You know, I've seen you and Kramer on television more than I've seen like, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld on TV, basically. You know, sometimes I watch TV and during commercials, I'm just like, I recognize all, first of all, all, it's only direct to consumers advertising on TV. I'm like, yeah. new stores are all direct to consumer stores building pop-ups. Yeah. On TV, it's just direct. One time I saw you, I think I saw like- um, Maybe Hubble. Hubble contacts, yeah. yeah. And then me, and I was like, <laughs> okay, it's just us now. And I'm like, I know all of these guys on TV. Yeah. Before I'd be like, oh, there's a celebrity. And now I'm like, yeah. I know all of these guys. I know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. I know That's what amazing. agency they're using. <laughs> exactly, they're exactly, ads. exactly. How do you start diverse? Like, what are the first, some of the channels? I, you know, I, I've seen you guys run Instagram, like um, influencers with like, I think it was like Kim Kardashian at one point. Uh, I've seen you run TV ads. Where are you spending money, you know, today or the last couple of years? And how do those things, back, like, you know, does TV still back out? Does it, like, do, you know, a native, we never could afford influencer ads with Kim Kardashian or like major celebrities. Um, do those things back out? Or is it like a learn, sort of test and learn process? We were is there a Yelp of... for influencers? Like there uh... should be a Yelp for working with influencers. I don't know if there's a Yelp. That's, a good, that's actually a great question. I, I know there is definitely databases full of like uh you know ability to to reach out and, and give information and feedback and, and engagement metrics yeah. so um but in terms of like you know how was the experience did it back out like did they do did they did they work yeah, with you well sense. like it didn't really it, yeah at least it didn't when we were doing it our first the, the biggest one was kylie jenner um for us that was like early early on and that was back in the day where like you know a lot of instagram influencer marketing was backing out especially people like like kylie who this is like, yeah, maybe it was 2015 that we did it, maybe 16. So it was early on in the company. Today, though, it's spread out. I mean, yeah, we still do Facebook. We do still do TV, podcasts, um, Instagram, obviously. Uh, I think we might still do some Pinterest. Um, and we've tested anything from like uh, Snapchat to uh, we've done uh, Taboola back in the day. So it's really like, I mean, I guess my strategy was, you know, you want to you want to figure out the right marketing mix and, and, and test into it. And even influencer, you have like different tiers, right? You have the Kylie Jenners of the world and then you have people who maybe have 10 million or less uh, who are, who are influencers, but that's, that's kind of their, their, their getting product and that's kind of their main source of revenue or, or their fashion, you know, or YouTuber. Uh, and then you have maybe below a hundred thousand or somewhere around there, maybe below 500,000 who could be micro. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we, so, so there's like, we're always testing, we're always trying to figure out, well, you know, where are we spending uh, the most efficient dollars? It doesn't make sense. Uh, are, you know, is the, is the amount of uh, sales that we're getting in one channel, like the incremental revenue we're getting there, like what does that actually equate to? Uh, and so we're just trying to figure out, like we're always testing. And that's what we've kind of built that in-house. And that's, yeah. I think, what's made us special is that, you know, if there is a marketing channel that comes around, like we can identify it. Uh, and apply kind of our methodology to it. And, and it's a very agile, you know, uh, methodology versus just, you know, buying TV, even though buying TV the way that we probably do versus buying kind of national broadcast it is different, but it's a little like buying on Facebook or buying on Taboola or Snapchat or any of those are, are, are Google are very, are more, are more similar, I'd say, than buying kind of paid media. Yeah, it's crazy how like, um, marketing is really a living organism like you can't be like okay facebook works it's gonna work for me forever you have to like diversify and like maybe taboola works for a year and then it doesn't i remember snapchat worked for us for a while didn't work for us after that yeah uh, like you really have to diversify those marketing channels pretty quickly um and like constantly be testing them to be like is it working now or is it not even facebook like you know which has been a, like facebook has been a behemoth obviously in digital advertising probably since 2014 
today, Facebook is like right now, Facebook is very different than it was, oh, yeah. you know, two months ago. Like if you talk to like Facebook just released earnings earlier today and they were like, uh, you know, we're not in from advertising cuts. You know, Expedia, the CEO of Expedia was like, we spend $5 billion a year on advertising. Usually this year we're going to spend $1 billion and we've already spent a ton of that. It's because like, you know, COVID's going on. And so yeah. Facebook ad prices have come down significantly. Yeah. I, I want to delve into influencer advertising because I feel like you guys were one of the earliest guys to do that. You were talking about 2015, 2016. Is it just a lot of like, uh, well, one, can you talk about the most you ever paid an influencer? Like what, I, I'm curious, I, I'm personally curious, what is the most you've ever paid an influencer? Uh, it was definitely in this, uh, it was it was somewhere around, for a single post, it was close to like, yeah, like $150,000. Okay, I'm gonna um, guess that's Kylie Jenner. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was early on, and yeah, yeah that was a, uh, that, that was, again, different in time like i don't think sure. that we certainly wouldn't do that today um unless it was like you know there was someone who's we're going to be ongoing working with the brand or you know collab or whatever the case may be but um so yeah that was that was a big chunk of change and why wouldn't you do that today is it because they're like the the numbers were backing out in 2015 and don't necessarily back out like in 2015 people People saw that and they were like, what is this? I want to engage with this. While in 2020, they're like, this is an ad by this influencer. Let me move past it. Or is it something exactly. else? I think, I think it's a combination of all of the above, right? Like back then it was, first off, the engagement wasn't, um, you know, repressed. They, yeah. you, you could, uh, so you're getting more engagement. You're getting, you know, more impressions, right? If she had 50 million followers or whatever it was back then, you know, majority of those people probably saw it. Uh, Facebook was, you know, the posts were chronological or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, and you, so there was that. And then also just, she wasn't posting a ton of ads, right? She wasn't, or, you know, collaboration. So, uh, I don't even know if she was posting much about her own stuff at the time. So this was just, it was just the right time, right place. And I think today even remove her, you know, any huge person, you know, with 50 million or, or more followers, like, I just don't, I, I, I don't think the engagement's there. Like people just yeah. aren't seeing the posts as much as they once were. And even if they do, they're just, I mean, instant, we're just, we're just, you know, used to it by now to see, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, it adds, you know, they're just, even yeah. if they're, even if they're, you know, as authentic as possible and they really use the product and they love the product, it, unless they really back something personally and are like, a, you know, they're, they're a partner. Like I just don't necessarily see it, uh, backing out like it once did. So, but and, you know, there's arbitrage elsewhere always, right? Like maybe yeah. TikTok's that next place. Yeah. Um, Maybe uh, Twitch, right? Twitch is a big place that we're trying to figure out, especially with those blue light blocking glasses. Like, yeah. you know, the gamers are are uh, are screens. Yeah, and they have. I mean, we you've, you've seen like the trends about the ninja ninja uh, yeah. gamer, and then there, there's just a bunch of them that honestly, I feel like the average person doesn't know much about, but it's this underground world that's just absolutely booming. Yeah, are you already advertising on TikTok right now? I don't know that we're do we have a TikTok account. We're creating videos. We're playing yeah. with it. I created. I finally created a TikTok just to figure it out. Uh, I've, I've I've now I now understand how something can get the amount of views uh, it does, and and I don't know if it's all 100% authentic, but nonetheless, people are seeing it. There's there's a lot more opportunity for the average person or or to to, to growth hack. Let's call it TikTok than there is Instagram today, in my opinion. I yeah. think you can get a lot more impressions on TikTok for free. And I see them doing some paid stuff. And the great thing about their paid stuff, which I don't think we've uh, gone into yet, but their paid stuff looks very, uh, it looks like a regular post. So yeah. you have to almost double take. And it's there, it says it, but you have to double take and go, oh, that's an ad. So they do a great job. Their ad units is what we call them are, yeah. are you know, really great. Um, but we are doing some stuff on Twitch, but that's not, that's, I don't think we're actually paying like Twitch commercials as much as we're um, working with individuals on Twitch kind of, yeah. Does any marketing channel represent more than like 25% of your marketing spend? Like is Facebook more than 25% Are influencers as, as a whole? I think, I think Facebook's still the majority, uh, still the majority. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I feel like it's pretty common for most e-commerce brands, but. Yeah. I mean, Facebook is just like, um, so good at what they do. Yeah. Uh, I, like I think the better place where you can create demand. Yeah. And That's the better, it. the better that you do at Facebook, uh, the better that you are at Facebook, the, the, you know, you get more learnings from like what creatives working, what ad units yeah. working, uh, your uh, certain audiences. So they're just, so, I mean, you ran it yourself, right. For, yeah. for so long as well. So yeah, it's yeah. just, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's the, the scary thing is when you get too deep in it and then Facebook starts dictating, you know, 
your, your business a little bit based off of like what's selling on Facebook too much. And you, you become reliant on, Oh, well this ads working for this specific, uh, you know, watch or this specific, you know, scent of deodorant and yeah. it's not necessarily working. It's, so it, it's a balance of like, is it the ad? Is it, so there's, there's, there's a, I don't know. It's a, it's, it's still relatively new in, in you know, comparison to TV or you know, anything else. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's both, uh, uh, at native is both our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. Like, yeah. um, we were great at it. It was minting us a ton of money and it was, uh, scary as hell. Cause we're like, when, what does this change? When we launch new categories, are they going to go as well as deodorant did? Um, yeah. it was really terrifying. Uh, are you guys more male or female focused? I have to imagine male because you guys just launched female more recently. But... We, we, we launched it a few years. Female, I think maybe 2016. So, so about four years now. Um, but it's, it's actually okay. closer. It's actually closer to 50, 50 now, I think in terms of product, if I'm not mistaken, oh, wow. we have a lot, we have a lot of uh, female buyers who buy for, you know, whether it's, you know, boyfriends or whatever the, you know, the case sure. may be. So it's yeah. watches and it watches, even sunglasses are, can be, you know, great gifting items. So we do get yeah. a lot of gifting. I don't know. Do, do I don't know if the, I don't know if deodorant is much of yeah. a gifting. <laughs> it, it's actually more than we ever would have realized. Really? Like, it's like, certainly not as much as watches. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're not gonna like Q4 is our slowest quarter. But yeah. like, you know, we are able to say, hey, Mother's Day, why don't you get your mom this pack of like, um, you know, healthy for you products? Yeah. And it works. I mean, it's not as good as watches yeah, yeah. definitely, but um, it's surprisingly okay. Um, uh, and are watches still the majority of your business right now? I would have to imagine. Yeah, watches, jewelry and sunglasses. Yeah. Watches are still the majority. Sunglasses launch is kind of secondary. Um, so sunglasses, and if you if you combine sunglasses and Ever Scrolls, um, they're definitely you know a, a growing kind of segment of the yeah. business. But watches are still the majority. Um, okay, let's fast forward to 2018. You're now talking to Movado. What is the first like? Is the first conversation with Movado face to face? Is it like, or it, it's like email? Is it like when the first time you met them face to face? Is it in LA or wherever they are? I have no idea. Where they're, the I think they're first to time we them. met them in, I th think they came to us. I want to say um, okay. we, we we I think they came to us. We uh, we had met with them. Um, or no, we had talked to them. We had a kind of a mutual contact. So we had talked to the CEO, you know, years before, just more so just, you know, again, I think you just want to, if there, I, if there's a way to work together one day, partner, if there's a way to, sure. you know, uh, just, just keep the dialogue open. Like, you know, here's, here's, here's who we are and what we're doing. And, yeah. uh, and, and then we ended up kind of getting in contact when we were, you know, contemplating it. Do we raise or, yeah. you know, what's, what's the case. And maybe there's an opportunity to work together or, or partner. And, uh, they were interesting interested in acquiring us and uh and then it was like well okay is that the right thing for us movement the company the employees and um and then as we you know went further we're just like this makes so much sense they have you know infrastructure that again complements like what we do today what we what where we want to go in the future um they have experience in you know obviously manufacturing and other categories so yeah. um i think they came out to us if i'm not mistaken um Either they came out to us or we went to them because I, I think it was, it was supposed to, you know, we, we needed to make sure that people didn't see us, you know, meeting yeah, sure. their employees yeah. or our employees. So, yeah. so they definitely didn't just come in the office out the gate, if I imagine correctly. I think it was, uh, it was like initial kind of meeting somewhere off site. And then I can't remember where it was. Where the are they based? Head, but, uh, they're in uh, New Jersey. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they're in New Jersey and then they have an office in, in New York as well. Gotcha. How often actually, they, they, they have office, they have off, they have offices all over the world actually, and, and I believe in Switzerland as well, and in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, how offices are you? How often are you out to New York these days? Uh, uh, well, before all of this, I was probably I, I wasn't out there too often, maybe like three or four times a year, um, which wasn't which wasn't too bad. And then that we make a trip like last year, I went to Dubai for a big conference and uh, Switzerland for a big conference. So um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't all that it wasn't too much, but um, definitely. Uh, yeah, I had never been to New Jersey beforehand. So this was, you know, four times in a year after was, was different, <laughs> but, and the vibe's a little yeah. different. I've never been over. to Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. I've never been to Cincinnati and I was like, I now have my favorite hotel, my favorite restaurant, yeah. you know, Oh, here's this Uber driver that I recognize again. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah I now so, understand what Cincinnati looks yeah. like. Yeah. Um, that was great. And, and like, is the process a long process? Is it a short process? Um, you know, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what is going on through your head as well? Like, you know, when you, when you haven't raised any money, 
by the, you know, and you're, you were in credit card debt when you started the business by the end of the, by the time you sold the business. And is the number that you sold for public or not public? The, the number we sold for is public. So it's, okay. uh, and can you mention, can you talk about that number? Yeah. So it was a hundred million dollars. Um, and then, uh, there was a hundred million dollars and then there was like an earnout component. Um, but for us, uh, the process took about like 75 days, uh, I believe. Okay from like initial kind of conversation. So it went fast because yeah. again, again, we were contemplating, well, do we raise money? What do we do? And, yeah. um, th and this was, you know, we, we, I mean, everyone wanted to move fast. So it was like a 75 day process of from initial, I think phone call to, you know, you, uh, you know, hire, you know, banks to kind of help you with the process. And then you meet, uh, yeah. you, you know, the, each party's meet and then there's due diligence kind of that they go through on your end. And, uh, and then it's just kind of figuring out, you know, any questions they have essentially because they need to be comfortable sure. with, yeah, yeah, of course. you know, the business and, and questions as well. So, and were you comfortable? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you think that the relationship that you had had for a few years with these guys was helpful in helping you have this exit? Like for us, I never had a relationship with PNG or almost nearly any of the guys who were talking to us until we were selling the business. Was your relationship with Movado, you know, that was built up over time important to that? Or do you think it would have happened anyway? I think it was important. We didn't have, we didn't have, it's not like I, I hadn't, you know, met or, or talked to them much. So it was like, you know, it was just, I think yeah. an introduction that uh, kept us top of mind. And, yeah. It's a more superficial um, relationship. Yeah. 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 And I, and I'd say that, you know, I'd say that I would recommend for entrepreneurs if they have, if they know who like a strategic is that they think that, you know, they could get acquired by and, and complement that business and help that business and, and vice versa. I think it's worth, you know, figuring out a way to, to get in touch with that person. And, yeah. you know, you, you, you obviously, you're always scared because it's competition. Like they could acquire you or they could, you know, all these companies are big enough to go and start their own version of it. Right. So uh, you, you, you want to, you know, you want to just have a conversation. It's like, you kind of, you know, dance around a little bit and, and be, you know, you want to create a, an authentic relationship without sharing too much of the business, but sure. you know, he, he was, he was always, a, you know, again, uh, he was a great, uh, you know, the conversation we had with him was really great. It was just, you know, a, an introduction time who we were, what our story was, the drop, you know, kind of what we're doing now. It was yeah. really just interested yeah. in who we are, what we were doing and um, wasn't trying to like, you know, get information or anything. It was just a very, and we had conversations with different people over the years. Um, and I, I actually have friends again, who are in certain businesses who make it a point to be really friendly with like, and they, they send them product unsolicited yeah. with a note, right? Like, and they, and it's just, and it could, you know, I think, I think, I mean, we're all humans, right? I think if you get, for, for some people who are really trying to reverse engineer that exit, like I think, yeah, if you have a relationship with someone who is in the driver's seat of making that decision and they're familiar with your business, it's going to get them more excited about the business. So um, versus just having no clue and then one day getting a call saying, hey, this is my business. Like it's, at, at that point, it's probably too late. So I, I do think it's probably yeah. a good idea to, to you know, yeah, it's really sometimes it works out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like those personal relationships are so important. I remember like, um, you know, getting along with somebody who you might work for or work with. It's so I, I remember when we were trying to sell native, um, there was a guy that we were chatting with and he's like, I can tell you're not serious about selling native online. And I was, I was like, how could you possibly say that? We're doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue, millions of dollars in EBITDA. He's like, because you don't own native.com. And I was just like, I don't know. I was just like, I, you don't know what you're talking about. And this is like the CEO of that company. Like, and, and we're sitting around a, uh, like a dinner table, with probably 10 people or 15 people, his senior executives um, are my bankers. And I'm like, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and like, there's just silence in the room. Yeah. I was just like, you have no idea what the fuck you're doing with e-commerce. Silence in the room. <laughs> Absolute dead silence. And I was just like... Um, and, and like afterwards, our banker, like our, my, the bankers and I were sort of just walking around San Francisco. And he's like, that was, our, our, my uh, banker was like, that was a really awkward conversation. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what else to say. This guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. When it comes to e-commerce, he's telling me, he, he has no business in e-commerce. He has no yeah. material business in e-commerce. Yeah. And he's trying to tell me about my, my industry. I'm not trying to tell him about his, but I know what, he, what he's doing yeah. wrong. And um, it gets me really excited. Afterwards, I love, like, afterwards, he takes me, like, you know, he and I go out to dinner one-on-one, -on -one, and he's actually great. 
and like he and I grew up watching like infomercials together and that's how we got good at marketing and we, I, I remember like talking about like the rotisserie chicken and like the Ron Popeil or whatever it was <laughs> rotisserie chicken I love the yeah. guy at, at, at the end I love the guy but like you know and, and I remember him saying he's like look there are probably three people I would trust to take over my business and you're one of them boys and I was like you know it sounds like you and I don't get along but in reality we stand up to each other and sort of appreciate what it takes to be a good marketer yeah. Um, and I really enjoy them, but it, like those personal relationships and who you're going to work with are so important, oh, yeah. especially post acquisition, right? Like the, the day you sign the docs, it's great, but like, you're going to have to work with this guy. You're still at Pizza watches for, you know, it's been a year and a half since you sold yep. the business. You, you know, you got to get along with that person on a daily yep, basis. Yep. No, absolutely. I think you hit it on the head. So you, you sell the business, you know, all this money, you, you go from, uh, in 2013, uh, be, you know, using your chase freedom card to now having, uh, you know, an Amex back in 2020. What is like, uh, you know, what do you do? What's the first thing you buy? What do you do with all this money? I think that was, it, it, it takes time to like settle in. I think for me, at least like trying to figure out like what, what you're supposed to feel when you, you know, set your company, you know, it's obviously bittersweet because that means it's not yours anymore. And, and, you know, like you're waiting for this day to have, you know, kind of have the financial, you know, freedom, so to speak that you want. And, but you're not going to go immediately and buy Like you're, it's not like you have a house lined up to buy tomorrow. And even if you buy yeah, the house tomorrow, true. like it takes another few months to like get settled in. And like, I'm, I'm 28 years old. So like, you know, I live by myself. So it's like, what do I actually need? Do I really want to go buy a house? So it's, it's, and it's figuring out just like what life's like and, and, and taking a breath and not going in and trying to invest in a bunch of startups right away. So for me, it was like, uh, you know, I think eventually the, my biggest purchase was, was, uh, you know, a condo that I'm in. It's a 1500 square foot condo. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's great for just me right now. Um, especially in quarantine. I'm glad I, 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 yeah. I did that, but, yeah. um, yeah, it's like, you know, and then it, for me, it's, it's like, you know, helping my family out and it's figuring out, you know, how I'm going to, you know, invest, you know, uh, the right way and, 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 and so forth. But I think the biggest balance is just like, for me, at least, and, and I, talk, I mentioned this a little bit before we started recording, was just kind of like, you know, ultimately it's like what makes me happy was like what I was always in kind of search for and like building a business, having a financial, big financial outcome was like always something that, I thought was something that was going to make me happy. And, and don't, and, and, and I think it's a component of it. I don't, I think if you're on, if you're unhappy in your life before and you sell your company, it probably is going to just magnify those issues even more uh, versus like, I think I was like in a pretty good spot, but this is giving me like, I can't really be complaining about, you know, my financial situation. So it's just right. figuring out like, what do I live for outside of just work and, and money? Like what are my hobbies or what, what makes, what, what makes me happy? And I think, Fortunately, that can be my focus, right? A large yeah. piece of my focus, which, which I'm super fortunate about. But uh, it's, it's, I think it's taken a couple of years to like, and I'm still working on it, but it's taken a couple of years to really figure out things that make me happy and like keep my, my brain kind of, you know, uh, stimulated, et cetera. What are some of those things? The one, I mean, the number one thing I think has to come down to just like working out for me. Uh, I think that like, if I work out, uh, any, whether it's cardio, anything, if I get a good sweat in and I instantly feel better that day, yeah. like whatever I eat later, I could eat like shit later that day, whatever it is, at least I got that workout in and like, yeah. and, and was moving and you just, it just, you feel better about yourself. It's, it's known to give you, you know, your, 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 you know, endorphins, et cetera. So I think that's a big one. Meditating has been big, you know, even if it's 10 minutes a day or even a couple times a week has been great. Um, you know, I think those, those have been th people, I think relationships, I've really realized like, okay, yeah. like, you know, you, you, you have this financial outcome, but like, and it doesn't need to be just like love relationships, but just friends in general. Sure. It's like one of, one of my favorite things is like going on a trip with, with, with buddies or doing things for, you know, my family, whatever it is. And it's like, those are things that make me happy. So, and I'm, I'm on a road to still figure that out. I think my biggest thing in, in, in life, to be honest, is just to figure out it's a pursuit of happiness. What is it that may, if yeah. you could be happy with a hundred K or 50 K year, like, I think that that's great. That's fine. It's just figuring out what is it that makes you happy. And I think everyone's kind of in the race to, 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 you know, make money because you need it to survive. And, and once you have your, I think your kind of the, your life, you know, your regular finances, your kind of, you know, necessary finances in place, I think it's then figuring out 
you know, the things that make me happy, I'm talking about working out, right? Like working out anyone can do. And, sure. and you know, everything else I'm talking about are, are things that people can do. So it's just, I'm just, I'm fortunate that I'm able to take a step back and really kind of focus on it though. Yeah, I, I think you're great. Like, I, I, you know, we met a few times in person, certainly. I think every time we get brunch in LA, I'm always like um, amazed at how, uh, you know, self-conscious you are about that happiness. Um, for me, I was always like, okay, great. Uh, being, uh, being wealthy is going to make me happy. Yeah. And, uh, it, it absolutely doesn't. You're absolutely right. And like, I, you know, I, everyone says, uh, being rich doesn't make you happy. And I feel like no one told me that. You know? like, <laughs> I, was, I didn't believe it. Yeah. I still blame everyone else. You're right. It, it is all about like what's inside of you. That's going to yeah. make you happy and not necessarily like, um, just, just spending yeah it happens. and it makes it easier don't get me wrong like if you yeah. it, like if you want to go take a trip or buy something but like i think i realized that like having a big tv or having a nice you know macbook or ipad those are those things don't don't those don't make my happiness levels for the moment i open it i get this joy and then it's instantly gone pretty much after that but like experiences experiences are like number one yeah i think i think health mental health you know your body keeping those like at an all-time high and then experiences that ultimately like yeah like you know if, if you i just try and look back on my life if i died tomorrow like if i look back on my life like what would i be upset i didn't experience yeah, or sure. do or, or or experience with certain people right like i have so many i, I think I'm, I'm also excited the fact that like just going through the journey of movement like these people i've done it with like you know especially early on like i have great relationships with those people and like and i, I want to make sure that like as people leave or like you know as the company changes that like I still maintain those relationships yeah. with those people. And that's super important to me as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the people that I worked with at native were like my best friends. Yeah. I love all of them. Yeah. I do anything for them. Um, yeah. It, it, and you're right. It, it certainly life is a lot easier, but it is crazy where you're like, man, I really want this thing. You end up making the purchasing decision to get it, or you get invited to this thing that you've always wanted to get invited to and you never were and yeah. you get invited to it. And you're just like, Oh, yeah. This is not going to make me happy. And you're just like, fuck. I got, and it's hard to also like um, mentally, like, you know, I, I buy something and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Moment of joy when you buy it, then all of that is gone instantly. And you're like, okay, here's this other thing that I want to buy. And you're like, you have to be, be like, you know what? Buying this thing is going to bring me two seconds of joy. Is that really yeah. worth it? I, I follow Justin Khan on Twitter. He, uh, he's the founder of Twitch. Right, I'm not yeah. sure if you follow him. He's fucking like, you know, everything he says, I'm just like, I want to be like this guy. Yeah. Like he has a ton, he has a ton of money and he's like, I'm trying not to buy anything because I buy this $10,000 watch and I'm just like, okay, I have a moment of happiness yeah. and afterwards I'm not happy about it again. And yeah. it's like crazy that that's so true. Yeah. And, and it happens to everybody. Like that, those material items just never make you happy. Yeah. I did it for the first time. I bought like a, like a, I bought some off white is what I did. That was my, I was like, let me, let me get, let me just see. I have yeah. to do it because, it, and I, and I swear to God, I haven't worn it once. It's still in my closet. Not even because of the Corona, just because I was like waiting for the right time. And yeah. now it's, I'm just like, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'll never do that again. So yeah, it seems uh, once you have them, you're just like, I have no idea why I pulled the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I know you're like um, an investor, an advisor, at least for a bunch of direct to consumer businesses. Um, I know like Skyler, I think is one of them that Skylar. you and I are both in. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think happens to direct to consumer? You know, uh, Casper uh, happened where people like, you know, this darling of the direct to consumer business sort of didn't go anywhere or like hasn't had a good out outcome. Uh, Outdoor Voices had to do, uh, do a recap. Um, you know, Brandless went out of business. COVID happened. WeWork happened. And all of a sudden, people are focusing on profitability. In the next five years of direct to consumer, are people building more natives and movements or movements in a or are people still going to the, you know, VC backed outcome? Or are they just built like, you know, what happens in the next five years? I think for D to C businesses, I, I think it's it's going to be a more friends and family. Like you may you may need more yeah. capital than a than a credit card, you know, uh, to, yeah. to to get it going. But I think yeah. people are going to be, uh, you know, have more, you know, relatively bootstrapped or or you know, profitable kind of conscious businesses. And I think it's still very possible. And and honestly, most of the companies that I invest in are either they're either profitable or like very 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 close to it. And the only reason they're not is because they're growing so you know aggressively, et cetera, that it that it makes sense. They're kind of on that that fence, yeah. but um, but yeah, I think I think again, I think there will be some interesting potential businesses that come out uh, of COVID that aren't necessarily D to C or may need uh, that may need capital to grow and maybe still you know chasing a, a big you know uh, exit. But I think in terms of like the direct to consumer brands, I think it's I, I just from what I've seen, the ones that are the healthiest and and able to. I mean, this is a good example. 
this is the, the most radical thing that's ever happened, right? Uh, and I think pretty much our, our lifetime, our parents' lifetime and their parents. But in terms of like, who can, you know, weather the storm right now are people who, you know, I think it's people who have good businesses that are profitable and, and can stay afloat. And, and if they need to be more lean, they can be more lean. Yeah. Um, but if you already, if you're already raised at a certain multiple, like the difference yeah. between getting back to that environment, you know, could take years to get that, that back versus a bootstrapped profitable company who maybe it adds another year and a half, two years to kind of your exit or wherever you want to, whatever you wanted to get to, but at least you can, you control your business, you maintain yeah. things like you, you, you stay lean and it just adds a little bit, you know, longer to, to, to kind of you know, your timeline, which I think is, is, is fine. And it's not the end of the world by any means. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with all that. Um, all right. Really, Jake, really appreciate your time. You know, you said uh, one of the things that brings you happiness is relationships. Uh, I feel like the first time you and I met was, I, I forgot where in Santa Monica, but like um, you and I were running through one of the few bootstrap companies existed that, uh, or like you were running one of those and I was trying to become one of those. <laughs> And I always admire that and like, you know, really got inspiration from the way you built movement. Um, and like every time you and I connect, I remember you and I connected and uh, was in awe of the business that you were building, was in awe of the way you were thinking about it. I remember when you're thinking about selling your business, you're like, I'm going to go and like, I haven't told my parents and I'm going to tell my parents and they're going to be super excited <laughs> and they're going to have this financial uh, yep. safety because of me. And uh, I was in awe of not only the way you were thinking about it, but how humble you were. Um, this relationship is one that brings me a ton of happiness. Uh, and, and I love connecting with you every time we do. I feel like, um, you know, you and I are kindred spirits that want to build profitable businesses that are willing to do that, that are like, you know, independently, that like are independent minded and sort of ignore the, um, Silicon Valley ethos of raising a ton of money and you, have, you and I have had great outcomes and we're both like on this path to find happiness. And like, I've realized now that it certainly doesn't come from financial success. Um, and I'm trying to figure out when you realize what it is, tell me so I can do what you're doing. <laughs> I'll share, I'll share. I couldn't, I couldn't have said it, I couldn't uh, have said it better, Moise. Yeah, please share. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better, man. I appreciate it. Uh, it's always been a joy to, to you know, hang out and to, to talk with you. I get insight from you all the time as well. So I totally appreciate it. And, and thank you so much for having me uh, on this podcast. I haven't done a podcast in a, in a while that I can remember. So I was excited about this one. Uh, um, so and, and, and wish you the best of luck with it. Of course.